Hey guys, so in this week's episode, we're gonna be talking about two superstars of the mushroom world, Cordyceps and Chaga. We're gonna be talking about the benefits and dive deep into how they're grown and all sorts of other interesting facts about these two incredible mushrooms. Also, to celebrate 100,000 subscribers, we're gonna be giving away four of these super cool uh, enamel mushroom pins. Uh, these are from Foldit Creations, and we're gonna be giving away those to one lucky subscriber and commenter. So all you gotta do to get in is comment below your favorite medicinal mushroom and make sure you're subscribed to the channel. And before Wednesday, July 22nd, I'm gonna pick one random commenter that wins all four of these enamel pins. Also, these particular videos are recorded live, so they're a little bit long, but if you do just wanna jump into any point of the discussion or any topic that you're interested in, I put timestamps in the description of this video so you can just click on those and jump into any part of the video that you're most interested in. So yeah, without further ado, let's get into this week's episode. We are live. Happy Friday. Happy Friday, everybody. Happy Fresh Cap Friday. And welcome back to another episode of Fresh Cap Friday Live, the uh, where we come every week and talk about mushrooms, yes. talk about mycology. Thanks for tuning in. This is fantastic. Connect with the Fresh Cap family. I hope everyone's having an amazing week. Um, and we got a cool show for you today. We're going to be talking about a lot of cool stuff. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much to all of our subscribers on YouTube. This week we hit 100,000 subscribers. We're at 101,000 subscribers on YouTube, which is just insane. It's amazing. I'm so excited about it. I'm so blown away by all the support that channel has had. And that's been one of the funnest things ever uh, is to have that YouTube channel. So if you're watching this on Facebook, uh, you might want to head over to that YouTube channel and check it out. And another reason why you might want to check it out is because we are doing a special giveaway. Yeah, on our YouTube. So, yeah. so how do they enter and what are we giving away? So we are giving away four of these fantastic pins from Foldit Creations. They're just these beautiful... Um, handmade yeah. enamel pins. Handmade enamel yeah. mushroom pins. And, and we have... One of them is a Chanterelle from left to right, depending on how this mirrors. Anyways, it's Chanterelle, Lactarius Indigo, uh, there's a Morel mushroom pin, and a Porcini pin. Um, they're super cool, super beautiful, super high quality. So we're giving away those two. And they have two attachments, so the pins won't spin. Right. Yeah, they're great. Yeah, Gavin from Folded Creations, they're located in Toronto. Ontario, Canada, and they do a fantastic job. These, job. These are really high quality. They're just amazing. And they have so many other cute ones. They do video game characters. I've seen like Star Wars, other animals. Yeah, it's just really cute. So check it out, Fold It Creations. Um, they're on Instagram, they're on Etsy. So again, if you want to win, if you're watching this on YouTube, just comment below, mm -hmm. uh, let us know your favorite medicinal mushroom, and we're gonna pick one winner. We're gonna pick that Wednesday morning. So as long as uh, your comment's in before Wednesday, as long as you're watching this before Wednesday, July, what is it, 20th, 20? I think? It's okay. the 17th today. Um, then you'll be in to win. 22nd? I don't know. I, we, I should've wrote that down. Oh, I did write it down. We're gonna July pick a winner. <laughs> Wednesday, yeah. July 22nd. Uh, at uh, 11 a.m. PST. Wow, that's very specific, Tony. It is very specific. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. And so. it doesn't matter which medicinal mushroom. It's not like we're picking a correct answer because there is no correct answer. Just comment. Exactly. Okay, so today, again, to get into the main topic, we want to talk about the five most popular medicinal mushrooms. We're only going to be talking about two of them today. We have chaga and cordyceps, two amazing mushrooms, two of my favorite mushrooms of all time. Um, so... First of all, I think it makes sense to talk about like what even makes a medicinal mushroom, right? Um, sometimes called functional mushroom. Sometimes called a functional mushroom, right? I mean, there's thousands of species of, of mushrooms. Only very select few hold that title of medicinal mushroom or functional mushroom. And even a smaller subset of those uh, become super popular. Um, so, you know, to, to become one of the most popular mushrooms is a really high bar to pass, right? Um, out of the thousands of species of mushrooms today, we're gonna be talking about two. Um, but generally it's because of the compounds that are in them, right? So all mushrooms have these beneficial polysaccharides or immune supporting polysaccharides or beta-glucans. But there's lots of other interesting compounds in mushrooms and different shapes of these polysaccharides in different mushrooms, which is why they all have their own kind of superpowers is mm -hmm. the way I like to think about it. And chaga and cordyceps are no different. They have very unique compounds in them, which we'll talk about uh, right away. So, yeah, so which one should we talk about first? Cordyceps? Yeah, first let's talk about cordyceps. All right. Um, oftentimes cordyceps is called the caterpillar fungus, um, which is kind of a misnomer for this particular mushroom, which is cordyceps militaris. Mm -hmm. um, there's 
over 700 species of cordyceps. And they're, most of them are, are parasitic. So how cordyceps grow, the actual life cycle of cordyceps is the spores will infect uh, typically a living insect uh, or like a worm or a moth or something like that. They'll actually like use the insect's body as like a growth medium and eventually fruit through the body. So it's a parasitic mushroom that actually kills the host. Yeah, and typically like on the Tibetan plateau, which is where the Cordyceps sinensis is found, the specific species of that, um, May and June is the time of year when families go out and they gather in these areas where these cordyceps mushrooms are found and they will forage and gather them and sell them. So there's about a two month period where they're actually finding them sprout, coming out of the ground. So it, the caterpillars are under the ground, the cordyceps infects them, it makes the caterpillars rise up to the top of the surface of the soil, and then the cordyceps mushroom will sprout from his head, will release other spores which then can affect, infect other caterpillars. Yeah, and traditionally Cordyceps sinensis it was the traditional kind of medicinal Cordyceps, right? Um, and you can still get Cordyceps sinensis today, but it is insanely expensive. Really expensive. Yeah, there was one study and there was 500 grams was sold for $26,000. Yeah, so that's actually insane. So yeah. I didn't even know that. I, I yeah. typically thought like the higher level was around $20,000 per kilogram. And I've actually seen this in some TCM shops or traditional Chinese medicine where you go and there's like a little tiny package of 10 grams of cordyceps sinensis with the caterpillar and everything, the fruiting body. It's actually pretty neat to see, yeah. um, but insanely expensive. Yeah, no, I researched that today. 500 grams was sold for $26,000. Which just shows you how exceedingly rare it is. And actually, mm -hmm. I think it's like almost becoming a little bit of a problem because this mushroom is more and more rare, but it's so valuable. So people go find it and there's, you know, there's, there's lots of fights and all sorts of stuff that happens. But uh, luckily, there's another species of cordyceps that you can actually cultivate. And the best part is you don't need to cultivate it on insects. This particular species of cordyceps you can cultivate on a bed of rice and soy, no insects whatsoever. And it mirrors, it's a very similar species and mirrors a lot of the benefits. And it actually contains a compound um, that's not necessarily in high concentration cordyceps sinensis, which is really important, which is called cordycepin. Yeah. So this species, which is this one, is called cordyceps militaris, and it can be cultivated, uh, I wouldn't say easily, it's still kind of a tricky species, mm -hmm. uh, but lots of people have figured it out and you can cultivate this in, in, in huge numbers and make it reasonable to actually use on a regular basis for yeah, medicinal mushrooms. This one in particular was grown on rice. Right. right and they just harvest the fruit bodies, they're not taking that rice layer or grain layer, that's disposed of in the end, so you are getting pure cordyceps militaris. Right, and the way it's grown basically is you take this bed of rice, you hydrate it, you inoculate it with a culture of cordyceps militaris, and you leave it kind of work through that substrate, and then how they fruit Cordyceps militaris, which is pretty interesting, is you actually put it in really cool conditions, so like 13 or so degrees Celsius, so they grow really slowly, and you um, put blue light on them, which kind of initiates pinning. And that slow growth actually increases the amount of beneficial compounds in the Cordyceps. Again, and the one I wanted to talk about today was Cordycepin, and that's um, it's a compound that's found specifically in Cordyceps militaris. It's something like 90 times higher in Cordyceps militaris than it is in Cordyceps sinensis. And it is a compound that actually has a lot of unique research behind it and is unique to Cordyceps. Yeah. Now when you think of the two, so say, okay, there's Cordyceps sinensis found in the wild, it's grown on these caterpillars and other forms grown on other bugs. But would there be a big difference in not just cordycepin, but other compounds compared to something that's grown on rice? But actually, these are very chemically identical. So with the exception of the cordycepin, which is found at higher concentrations in cordyceps militaris mushroom, but they've done HPLC analysis on these mushrooms and the two profiles are extremely identical and they can be clinically interchangeable between sinensis and militaris. So, both effective, but what you'll be able to take more of because it's more cost effective is the militaris. Right. Yeah. So one thing that's really, and that's a really good point actually to make to make clear because like people are like, oh, it's a totally different species, um, but still cordyceps. And a lot of times it gets used interchangeably, especially in the supplement world. But the problem with that being used interchangeably is a lot of times it might say cordyceps sinensis when it clearly isn't, right? right? It, unless yeah. you're paying 
what did you say, $26,000 for 500 grams? Yeah, in uh, one case, yeah. Yeah. But that also goes back to our discussion last week, right? Right, right. So, where On the some difference. companies just really don't know what they're selling. So they might do a quick Google search and say, hey, oh, okay, I want to sell Cordyceps Sinensis. And then that's what they put on their label. So you always have to know, uh, dig into those labels and see what you're buying and buy from a trusted source. So, so one of the things I want to talk about again with cordycepin is the reason why it's so interesting and so effective is because it actually um, kind of mimics adenosine, right? Yeah. And I'm not a, a biochemist, but from my understanding of it, adenosine is, is obviously used in the production of adenosine triphosphate, right? Which is ATP, which is used in energy production, which mm-hmm. is used in cell energy production, what we use for our bodies. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, it's, it's used to increase endurance and increase energy. And that's how you kind of... Um, characterize cordyceps is kind of the energy mushroom, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Used by a lot of athletes, uh, but used just for people who are kind of looking to increase their energy and endurance. And, you know, there's been lots of studies done on cordyceps um, on humans and on on mice. So the mice studies, kind of what they do is they feed them uh, cordyceps and then they get them to run and swim and basically see how long they can do it before they fatigue. And they find that the mice can actually go much longer and fatigue in, uh, take a longer period of time to get to fatigue if, from the cordyceps group, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, so the cordycepin is so closely, um, not related, but looks so close, so similar to the adenosine molecule that the body confuses it and will use it in biological processes. Yeah, and the studies they've done on humans is also really cool. It shows that it can increase VO2 max. Uh, but interestingly, more so in uh, like non-athletes or like sedentary people. So people who aren't at peak physical shape, they have a much bigger uh, response, response yeah. to cordyceps. Yeah. And they think that's the reason because like most athletes are super dialed in, super toned in athletes uh, are already kind of maximum efficiency with their oxygen utilization. So it doesn't have the same effect. That being said, anecdotally, we do work with some athletes, some runners who use cordyceps. Um, and get massive benefit out of it. So that's really cool as well. Yeah, Anthony Kunkel is one of our elite athletes and he's been using cordyceps for a few years now and he tracks everything on a very small scale. So every change he's making to his diet, he's tracking, right? Mm -hmm. A very um, magnified scale, whatever you'd say. So it's very interesting to see his response to the cordyceps and how his body reacts to it and uses it and it does improve his performance. He's the best. Yeah, no, it's great. Yeah. So I guess the one other thing I'll say about Cordyceps Militaris is uh, I've seen it before where it's actually like turned into a snack. So they yeah. basically just dry these fruiting bodies, you just eat them, and they're actually pretty good. Like when you have a Cordyceps extract in your coffee or something, it is one of those ones that has like a pretty strong flavor yeah. uh, that not everybody is super down for. So sometimes you got to put it in a smoothie or protein shake or or whatever, or yeah, take it I in a capsule. Yeah, I better mixed with something that has more flavor. Right. So a smoothie, or you could bake it into granola bars or... Yeah. But for whatever reason, dry and crunchy, they're actually not too bad. And before these were dry, <laughs> they were actually quite large and puffy. Yeah. So it almost looked like a Cheeto, nature's Cheeto. They do totally look like Cheetos. <laughs> and you've had them as a snack. Yeah, correct? they're good. Yeah. yeah they're... What did it taste like? Um, and it was just deep fried, correct? No, I think it was just freeze dried. Oh, it was just freeze dried. Yeah, it was freeze dried. Okay. So it was crunchy, airy. Yeah, just, it's yeah. just kind of like a snack. I don't know. It's almost like eating a, a pretzel or something. Is that maybe a bad description? I don't know. I don't know. Anyways, cordyceps, super interesting, super cool mushroom. We could go on talking about it forever. If you have any questions about cordyceps, feel free to toss them in the comments below. I always love reading through those. Um, And again, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, feel free to hit that like button and subscribe. We do these kind of videos every single week. Um, So if you're interested in mushrooms, you're in the right place. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're looking for lung benefits, oxygen benefits, um, endurance benefits, Cordyceps is definitely something to check out. Great. Okay, so the next mushroom we wanted to talk about today is this big lump of coal that we got in front of me. I can go bring it. Go show it, yeah, do a quick zoom up. Now, chaga is actually super interesting. And actually to say chaga mushroom when you're referring to this is again a bit of a misnomer because it's not technically a mushroom. It's actually kind of a combination of chaga mycelium. Scientific name is Inonotus obliquus, which has some significance, and we'll talk about that in a second. But uh, the chaga mycelium and birch wood, or the wood of whatever tree that it's growing on. So it forms like this, um, they call it a, a canker or a sterile conch or a sclerotium. It's kind of this blend of, of yeah, bark 
uh, birch wood and chaga up mycelium. Um, and yeah, it's kind of like rock hard rock when hard. it's fresh. It's a little more like yeah. cork. Um, this is not a gourmet mushroom. You would not chop it up and cook it and eat it. No. no. In fact, you'd think it's just like almost like wood or something. It was a yeah, very... You would wonder if it's just part of the tree. Yeah. 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 And how chaga is typically prepared is like it's ground down or shaved down into a powder and then extracted in hot water to make kind of like a tea. And that was kind of how it's traditionally um, been used, right? But there's a lot of compounds in chaga that are not necessarily water soluble. So sometimes like an alcohol extract is, is pretty good. And those compounds, one of which is called betulin, um, which comes, it's, it comes from the name, uh, you gotta look this up, the name of the, the scientific name of the birch tree that it grows on. There it is, betula pubescent. So that's where that word betulin comes from. If it's not grown on birch tree, um, apparently it still does have some betulin somehow, which is but, interesting. Uh, so it just shows that the mycelium actually produces a small amount. Right. But it's a very small amount compared to a supplement made from the chagosclerotium. Right, because it mainly comes from the birch tree. Right? Yeah, kind of this symbiotic relationship. Right. Now, one of the interesting things about chaga, again, this is, this is a, a sterile conch. Um, but the fruiting body of chaga mushroom is kind of like this exceedingly rare thing that like nobody ever sees. Um, and it's kind of like one of these holy grails of mycology to actually see the fruiting body of, of chaga mushroom. Yeah, so some people will, will refer to one of these conchs as a fruiting body, but technically that is the wrong way to describe it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because the fruiting body, like after the tree dies, it actually like shows up on top of the, the chaga and it kind of disperses its spores and then it finds like little holes on other trees that can infect with the chaga and kind of go over and over again. So much like cordyceps, actually, chaga is a parasitic mushroom. Yeah. Not parasitic to insects, parasitic to trees. Yeah. And that very, very rare fruiting body is so rare that it is not used as a dietary supplement because you just you just can't find it. Yeah, it's very rare. I mean, the the sex life, if you will, of chaga mushroom or like the reproductive cycle is still kind of a mystery, right? Um, so it's, it's just one of those super interesting mushrooms. Now, in terms of characterizing what people use chaga for or the history of chaga, you know, one of the main things that chaga has been used for histor historically is for digestive health, yes. digestive benefits. And some of the thinking behind that is like some of the antimicrobial uh, benefits from chaga is what's kind of helping out with the digestive health. Chaga is, um, like I said, it's not a gourmet mushroom, but it is actually pretty tasty. Like if you just take chaga and you make like a chaga tea, uh, it kind of looks like coffee and it actually tastes pretty good. And actually there's been some places where they do use chaga mushroom as like a, a coffee replacement if you can't get it. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, so it's not one of the ones that is very off-putting. Um, it's, it's fairly nice. A little earthy, pairs well with chocolate. Right. It's great. Right. Um, and also another thing I want to talk about is chaga is always wild crafted. It's, it takes really long to grow and it can't necessarily be cultivated. Of course, you can grow the mycelium on grain or whatever, but to get the actual, I don't want to say fruiting body, but the actual canker, the actual sclerotium, uh, needs to be wild harvested from birch trees. But there is some people looking into how you can possibly cultivate it, but it's, bas it's not necessarily cultivating like you typically cultivate mushrooms. It's more so just kind of expediting the natural process. So they'll go to these large forests. natural birch forests yeah and try and inoculate the birch trees with chaga mushroom or chaga spores, and then come back five years later and hopefully find a really high concentration of chaga mushroom. Yeah, and that, that's been happening in Finland? Is yeah, it Finland? it's been happening yeah. in Finland, Right. which is pretty neat. I think that's pretty cool. Um, Do you know if they've had success with that? I don't actually know. I just- Maybe I've, it's too early. Yeah. yeah. I'm not too sure, but I've heard of people that um, been there and seen it. It just, it seems like a pretty cool idea. Like, why wouldn't you do that, right? Yeah. I don't know. So yeah, the other thing that chaga is quite often used for is for skin health. Yes, um, and, and especially with people with psoriasis. Yeah, and there's been, there's been some studies done. I tried to look up the study that was done on psoriasis. It said that there's a 50 people and they were all using chaga and, and they used it for like 8 to 16 weeks and they had like a 50% cure rate or something, which is really, really cool. Yeah, and I think a lot of those benefits were seen after 9 to 12 weeks. So with any dietary supplement, anything that's natural, usually you don't feel the benefits immediately right away like you would with an aspirin. Um, so that's good to know that these are 
better taken long-term with daily use so your body can absorb these compounds and put them to work. Right. Yeah. And I couldn't actually read the study because it, well, it was in, in Russian. Russian, so I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't figure it out. But a lot of this information we're actually, you can get in uh, this book here. This is Martin Powell's book. And I'll show you if you're interested at all in medicinal mushrooms, this is just an incredible resource. Yeah. It's called Medicinal Mushrooms, a Clinical Guide clinical guide by a gentleman named Martin Powell. He's an absolute expert in uh, both traditional Chinese medicine and in mushrooms. Um, so it's a really great resource, really great book. And he's just a great dude. Yeah, and he's done so much research because he, he's really trying to find the best treatment path for his clients right. in his practice. So he's done a lot of research into medicinal mushrooms, finding out specific doses, specific strains, specific extraction methods. So it's a very interesting book to read. Yeah, he's yeah. definitely got a passion for it and has been doing research in it for a long, for a long, long time, time yeah. uh, which is really cool. So that is cordyceps and chaga. And chaga. Yeah, um, in a nutshell. So I hope you found that interesting. I just find the medicinal mushrooms just so fascinating because like I said, out of the thousands of species of mushrooms out there, you know, you end up talking about a couple of them, right? And it's just so cool. Um, to see what they can do and how they each have their own superpower and also how there's so much more to learn and so much more to know, right? Yeah, and we didn't talk about all the benefits here. There are other benefits that have been studied. Like I know cordyceps for fertility and sex life and all that kind of stuff. So there's still things that we haven't gotten into. So I don't think this is the comprehensive analysis of what these mushrooms can do, but it's just a good place to start. Yeah, absolutely. So one more time I'll say uh, we are doing a giveaway of these uh, four fantastic pins. So we have the Lactarius Indigo, the Chanterelle, the Porcini, and the Morel. And yeah, those will be going away to uh, being given away to one lucky YouTube commenter. So comment below. Yes. Get in to win. We'll be drawing on July 22nd. So if that date has passed, sorry, they've already been given away. Yeah. And basically how we're going to do it is on Wednesday, I'm going to look at all the comments, put them all in your spreadsheet, pick something absolutely random, uh, and then gonna reply to that comment and say hey you won and then we can figure out your shipping address and all that kind of stuff great so what which mushrooms are we talking about next week lion's mane yeah next week i wanted to talk about lion's mane or uh, and what else do you want to talk about uh maitake let's talk about lion's mane and maitake and okay. that is actually perfect because those two mushrooms have something in common Ooh. and that's the fact that they are both amazing medicinal mushrooms and amazingly tasty gourmet mushrooms, which mm -hmm. these two are not. <laughs> They're just... Well, uh, you can have snacks. Out of I these, guess so. A crunchy found. little snack. But yeah, yeah, not typically found as yeah. snacks. So, okay. Well, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for being here. Thank you again for the 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. That is just still blowing my mind. I'm absolutely, I think that's absolutely insane. Yeah. Um, okay. Until next week. Until next week. Thanks for tuning in. Bye, have everybody.